boundaries of biblical views of creation? What must be held to to be orthodox? Well, you have to hold to the gospel to be orthodox in the sense of being within the framework of salvation. So, you know, we're not talking about the gospel, we're talking about a view of Genesis. Um, but I would say a faithful, a faithful understanding of what the Bible says is orthodox with regard to, to Genesis. Um, that is to say, reading nothing into the text from science, philosophy, worldviews, but as in every case in dealing with the Word of God, letting the Bible say exactly what it says. To me, that is critical in the book of Genesis. It's critical everywhere in Scripture, but certainly critical in the book of Genesis. One of the things that we've been talking about, uh, the glory of God, one of the things that uh, rings throughout the pages of Scripture, Old and New Testament, is the glory of God the Creator. I mean, I read that this morning. The one who said uh, light should shine out of darkness is the one who has shined in our hearts to give the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you diminish the fact that it was God who ex nihilo instantly brought light out of darkness, then you diminish the meaning of the text itself when it relates to the gospel. The implications of tampering with Genesis stretch throughout the whole of the Scripture. I think it is only right that you take Genesis at its face value, which is a six, 24-hour day or 23-point-something um, treatment of the text. There's nothing about evolution in there. There's nothing about day ages in there. Uh, there is nothing other than a straightforward presentation of what we have in Genesis at its most simple reading, six 24-hour days dis uh, discussed as a period of light and a period of dark. There was morning and there was evening, and it was this day and it was morning and there was evening and this day. So I, I think uh, you have also in Exodus as, um, as the Lord created for six days and rested on the seventh, so you work and rest on the seventh. And the implications are massive, and not just for what is said in Scripture, but for how you interpret Scripture. If you can play fast and loose with Genesis and say that it doesn't mean what it says, you know, when does it start meaning what it says? You know, when do you kick in? Genesis 3, 5, 9, Exodus? You know, where do you start saying, okay, now we can take it for what it says? Uh, and I think what I tried to do in the, in the series that I did on Genesis, I preached on Genesis 1, 2 for, I don't know, months and months. Uh, the condensed in the book, but the series that I did, uh, the actual preaching series, which is available, was in much more detail, was to take the Scripture and just exegete it at face value and then bring to bear on it true science and see if, if in fact, true science didn't reflect the accuracy of the creation account. And that was so stunning to me that it did. And I, I forayed into a field that's completely alien to me, the field of science, and it was a, it was a tremendously um, thrilling thing to see that true science was in perfect accord with what Genesis says, as we would assume it would be, since it is an accurate divine record of what actually happened. So I think that is where you should be. There's no reason in Genesis 1 and 2 to take any other view, day-age views, all those evolutionary views, theistic evolution, progressive creationism, whatever they are, have to be imported and they are always imported from outside the biblical text. They are always imported from the modern scientific worldview, which I think is unnecessary, obviously. So we can take Genesis at its face value. And it will stand every test. Um, so that's basically where you would put the, the line of orthodoxy. I think this. an orthodox treatment of Genesis 1 and 2 is to come out with a six 24-hour day creation just as Genesis says, uh, depending on what you mean by orthodox. I mean, but that would be, in my estimation, the purest, truest representation of what those verses are saying. And they're really not saying anything else. So any other view is imported in. I think that was the intent of the question, yeah. what must be held to, to, right. to be orthodox. Anybody else want to?
Well, let me just say, Paul, that uh, when I was in graduate school in the Netherlands was when I first encountered the framework hypothesis uh, from the pen of Nicholas uh, Ritterboss, not the more famous Herman Ritterboss. And uh, I remember at that time saying, well, here that it's possible, it would seem to me, for somebody to hold to the inerrancy of the Bible and from a hermeneutic perspective, actually believe that there's a literary structure here in the creation account that was never intended to indicate a six 24-hour day period, but rather that this was sort of like uh, stanzas in a hymn or scenes in a drama where the phrase morning and evening, second day, was like act one, act two, act three, and so on. And I remember, I think what was driving that at the time was, of course, scientific uh, considerations, the antiquity of the earth and so on. Uh, and I also have to say that I believe that, I, I've said many times, the church has got egg on its face by taking positions against science because the church thought they were speaking biblically when they weren't, because the church had imported into the old biblical understanding an older scientific perspective, like geocentricity. And because the Bible speaks about the heavens moving, uh, the sun moving across the sky, does not mean that the, the, that the Bible is teaching that the uh, earth is the center of the solar system. That was uh, an assumption brought from the scientific community, of Copernicus, I mean, of the Ptolemaic view, into the scriptures, and the church got itself in big trouble. Because I believe the Bible teaches that not only does the Bible give us the infallible revelation of God, but also nature reveals God. And so we have to, I listen when the, the uh, scientific community might give me information that corrects my understanding of scriptures, never going to correct the scripture. And so for many years, I held, I didn't hold to the framework hypothesis, but I held to the possible legitimacy of it. Until I read Doug Kelly's book, where he wrote the whole thing was on an exegetical study of Genesis, and when it comes right down to it, if we clearly understand what, that that's what the text is saying, then that's what the truth is, you know? And so I've been persuaded that, that the documentary hypothesis is not a sound exegetical approach to Genesis. So I'm where John is on this point. Anybody else want to… Is a corollary of that something akin to Usher's dates or yes. something like that? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I, well, the first time I taught in a Christian college, freshman class of Old Testament introduction, the, I go to… I have 250 students in the classroom, and the class is so big I have to teach it in a chapel, and I go up there to the… There's a pulpit Bible on the first page. At the top of the page, it says, creation, 4004 B.C. And I said, you got whole generations of Christians fighting to the death to defend that date of creation as if it were in the text of Scripture. You know, and I had to say, let's get started. When we're going to start on Genesis 1, let's start up with Genesis, not with Archbishop Usher's calculations. Because that's, I don't have to, thank God as an apologist, I don't have to defend Usher. But I, I don't have to defend Genesis. They're not the same. But, but you would hold for a young earth then. Yes. Uh, somewhat like Usher's dates. Somewhat like Usher's date, <laughs> you know. But I think you missed it by two or three years. 